The hills of Sicily. Everywhere ruined castles remind us that for thousands of years, invaders have visited terrible violence on this beautiful land. But beneath this castle at Ajira is a lonely cemetery, a reminder of a bloody struggle of our time. Towards twilight, the birds always gather here, but the graves themselves are rarely visited. This is Ajira Canadian War Cemetery in Sicily, and it contains the graves of more than 500 Canadians killed in the Sicilian campaign. Sicily was Canada's first real battle of the Second World War, but it was only a taste of things to come. This is the grave of Company Sergeant Major Charles Nutley of the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment. He was killed 10th of July, 1943. He was the first Canadian to die in Sicily for king and country. By the summer of 1943, the Second World War is in its fourth year. For almost all of that time, the men of the 1st Canadian Division have been parked in England, held back in reserve by the Canadian High Command, who are hoping for a major campaign where they can commit all of the 26,000 men. There are endless sports events. to a flying start in this year's first corps, Royal Canadian Army Service Corps sports meet. Endless parades. An inspection of the first division of the Canadian Army was begun. The inspecting officer was Major General Guy Simmons. And endless training. It is an army which has played a long waiting game. An army highly trained and highly skilled. While other allied armies are in the fight, it seems as if the 1st Division has been forgotten. Training in England with the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, the Hasty Peas, is 22-year-old Farley Mowat. During the first week of June, the unit was granted four days leave. Men streamed out from all points of the British Isles, knowing full well that this was their last opportunity to drink in English pubs, make love to English girls, and live, laugh, and be merry. For tomorrow, we go battle fighting. But now, in the summer of 1943, they will get their chance to join the war. Now, it seems, they will no longer be the Forgotten Army. England, June 1943. 26,000 Canadian troops of the 1st Division board more than 50 ships and depart England. Part of a huge Allied invasion force that is finally going to strike back at the Axis powers in Europe. After years of waiting, the men are spoiling for a fight. Only the Canadian commander, Guy Simmons, knows their final destination. On board ship is 28-year-old Strom Galloway of the Royal Canadian Regiment. Finally, on June 28th, we noticed that a large convoy was forming around our ship. We put to sea, and the next day at noon, a message was posted on all notice boards. It read, following message has been received from the Rear Admiral. We are on our way to the Mediterranean 
to take part in the greatest combined operation ever attempted. The tide of war has shifted. The Allies have driven the Italians and Germans out of North Africa, and now they can attack fascist Europe itself by assaulting its weakest link, Italy. Their first objective, the island of Sicily. Soon the Canadian convoy meets up with 160,000 British and American troops off the western shores of Sicily and form up for the seaborne invasion, codenamed Operation Husky. But unknown to the Canadians, enemy submarines are shadowing the convoy. And in the approach to Sicily, they strike. Three ships go down. 55 Canadians are killed. And much of the Canadians' transport is lost. More than 500 vehicles and guns. Undeterred, the men remain in high spirits. All ranks were lighthearted, but there were some solemn moments. Before the assault, Holy Communion was held for Protestants and Catholics. And at the former service, the communion wine had to be replenished several times. I talked to the men in their mess deck, telling them of their specific jobs. The average age was about 24, although there were a number who, claiming 20, look about 18. In their shorts and open neck rolled up sleeve shirts, they look like a bunch of Boy Scouts. It's hard to believe that these are the assault troops, which will be the newspaper's probable description of them. On July 9th, as final preparations for the invasion are made, a massive storm blows in, threatening the entire operation. The afternoon of the 9th, a Scirocco, the dread gale of the Mediterranean, sprang up, and monstrous white cap waves created uneasiness as to the success of our landings. But the winds abated, and we prepared ourselves for battle. Early in the morning of the 10th, the storm becomes less severe, and the generals decide to go ahead with the invasion. The plan is that Allied forces, British, Canadian, and American, will land on the beaches of the southeast coast of Sicily, near the city of Pechino. Somewhere on Sicily, waiting for the Allies, are 200,000 Italian soldiers backed by 60,000 elite German troops. As the Canadians prepare to land, the only experience they have ahead of a seaborne invasion is the bloody disaster of Dieppe, only a year before, where Canadian troops were shot down in the hundreds on the beaches as they came ashore. Hundreds of ships unload thousands of tons of high explosives on the Italian and German positions in preparation for the invasion. This is the Amber Coast in southeast Sicily, and it was on this beach that 5,000 Canadian soldiers started the invasion of Sicily. The Allies were very concerned about what sort of defenses the Germans and Italians were going to put up, so they amassed a huge armada. And you can imagine 2,500 ships out there bombarding the hell out of the German positions just behind us here on the sand dunes. At 4 a.m., the Canadians made their run in. The 1st Regiment here, Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, the Hasty Peas, landed. They were followed quickly by the Royal Canadian Regiment, Princess Pats, Sea Force, Royal Eddies, and the battle for Sicily was on. The 
The Canadian landing zone is on a stretch of beach known as the Amber Coast, just southwest of the Sicilian city of Aquino. Twelve kilometers off the beaches, the men clamber into the landing craft, dangling from their transport ships. Heading for shore in a landing craft is 22-year-old Farley Mowat of the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment. Dawn was breaking, and a low, pale shoreline was emerging into view a mile ahead of us. I scanned that formless strip of land with agonized intensity, desperately hoping to recognize some landmark. A vast, yeasty waterspout appeared alongside and seemed to hang suspended over us. I sprinted to the edge of the ramp, shouting, follow me, men, and leapt off into eight feet of water. Weighted down as I was with Tommy gun, grenades, and ammo, I went down like a stone, striking the bottom feet first. So astounded was I by the unexpected descent into the depths that I made no attempt to thrash my way back to the surface. I simply walked straight on until my head emerged. As the men wade ashore, expecting a hail of bullets, they meet only scattered resistance from a few Italian troops. Seven Canadians are killed, but there is no sign of the Germans. The landing had gone extremely well, in fact, far better than expected. But it was clear the Germans had withdrawn, and now the Canadians were going to have to push inland to find them, and things were going to get a lot tougher. Under a hot, brilliant Sicilian sun and temperatures of 40 degrees, the Canadians advance into a landscape of vineyards and little white houses. Tired of a war they never wanted, the Italians put up little resistance and line up to surrender. The Allied plan is to cut the Germans off before they can reach their escape route out of northeastern Sicily. But because they had lost all their vehicles at sea, the Canadians must pursue the Germans on foot. The whole move with troop-laden tanks grinding up the dusty road was a nightmare. The men looked as though they'd been dipped in flour, the tanks having churned up so much chalky roadway that they had been in thick clouds of dust the whole journey. For days, the Canadians advanced through dozens of villages marching along dusty, twisting country roads. And there's still no sign of the Germans. Following the landing, the Canadians pushed 50 miles into central Sicily. And that doesn't sound like very much, but you've got to consider the conditions. Sicily is brutally hot in the summertime, and the Canadians were advancing primarily by foot. But the real problem is the terrain. And you can see it. Sicily is all mountains and rivers and ridges, and the only way through are on windy roads, and the Germans have everyone pegged. I can't imagine how you could fight a war under these conditions. Five days after landing, the Canadians finally meet the Germans. The crack units, the Hermann Goering and the 1st Parachute Divisions, ambush the Canadians in a number of small, violent attacks. But these are skirmishes, only meant to delay the Canadians' assault on the mountain strongholds, Leonforte, Osoro, and Ajira, protecting the German escape route through the port of Messina 
at the northeastern tip of Sicily. The idea was to probe the high ground between two hilltop towns to see if the enemy were holding it in any strength. We drew enemy fire and Cameron, our lead scout, was hit. It was then that the German sniper opened up on us. A couple of bullets sang overhead in quick succession and we took to our heels. Norton got it right through the stomach. He fell forward, dropping his rifle. Norton was dying and he knew it. I tried to cheer him up by saying we'd soon have him back to a doctor. But he merely said, I'm finished, sir. By July 17th, the Canadian advance came to a sudden halt. They had reached a series of positions where the Germans had decided to take a stand. As usual, they picked the very best spots, and there was none more formidable than a sorrow. In its thousand-year history, a sorrow has never been successfully attacked. Standing on a mountain ridge 900 meters high, it forms with the other fortress towns along the ridge, Leonforte and Ajira, a formidable defensive position. As the Canadians approach Osoro, the Germans look down confidently from the heights. This is the peak overlooking Osoro village. And from here, you can see the Canadian battlefield of July 17th to 23rd, 1943. The Germans had set up a defensive position from that little mound over there, which is Leonforte, across this ridge and into a sorrow. But the real thing you notice here is the advantage of observation. The German spotters from any one of these positions could see anything that moved. Their main focus was on the road, because that's where the armor's gonna come. But they could even pick off a man in an orchard. The town of Osoro appeared to be virtually impregnable. So it must have seemed to our commander, Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Sutcliffe, when he received the order to mount the attack. Sutcliffe set out to make his reconnaissance. He and our intelligence officer, Maurice Cocken, made their way to a forward observation post. Sutcliffe and Cocken crouched in the open, map boards in front of them and binoculars leveled the lenses winking in the sun as they anxiously scanned the mighty battlements looming ahead of them. They did not realize that they were being regarded in their turn. Up on the Osoro Scarp, the German crew of an 88 lay their gun over open sights. Seconds later, Sutcliffe lay dead and Cocken dying. This fired us with rage against the enemy. This killing before the battle had been joined seemed singularly vicious, almost obscene. We're on the eastern slope of Osoro. And from here, you can see the peak, which is about 2,700 feet in the air. And you can see the ruins of the Norman castle. The Canadian plan was really quite simple, or simple in statement, very difficult in execution. What they were gonna do is make a night attack by single file, filing through these hills, across this gully over here, climbing this incredibly steep rock face, and then surprising the Germans. To me, this idea was fantastic, because if it worked, it was great. But if the Germans caught on to them, they were gonna be annihilated. So basically, through the night, the Canadians came up. There was about a group of 40 men just carrying machine guns, rifles, ammunition, the simple stuff. And they led the assault up this rise. On and on we went until about 0400. Under the pallid light of the late rising crescent moon, we scaled the final ridge and were appalled to find the base of the mountain wall looming sheer above. During the climb that followed, each of us performed his own private miracle. From ledge to ledge, we oozed upward like some vast mold. Those who faltered clung with straining muscles till someone heaved from behind or hauled them from above. 
Weapons were passed up hand to hand, and no man dropped so much as a clip of ammunition, which was as well, for any sound would have been fatal to us all. These are the ruins of the Norman castle overlooking a Sorrel village. And it was here that the Hasty Peas made the most brilliant assault of the entire Sicilian campaign. At about 4 a.m., the assault group of the Hasty Peas reached this crest over here, and they managed to overwhelm a small German garrison. And within 10 minutes, the whole peak here was in Canadian hands. Private A.K. Long jumped to catch the lip of what seemed to be the next terrace and disappeared above me. Then, with horrifying abruptness, the silence was destroyed with the barking of a Tommy gun. With a convulsive effort, I clawed at the rim and hauled myself over the top. The crumbling wall of the ancient castle loomed close at hand. Directly in front of me, and only a few feet distance, A.K. Long was down on one knee, with his Tommy leveled at three German privates, standing as rigid as store dummies. Sprawled at their feet lay an artillery sergeant, the first man to die that day, upon the crest of Mount Asoto. More hasty peas came up, to the point where they had 500 men here, ready to hold off the Germans. The assault was only one part of their problem, because once they were here, they were not only above the Germans, but behind them. And they knew that the Germans could not allow this to stay that way. So they had to come after them. So you can come over here, you can see where the Germans were. There's the village of Asoro. So you can imagine the fear in the Germans when all of a sudden the firing from behind them starts. So they started to call in their artillery from all these surrounding ridges. They were firing rockets. <laughs> But nonetheless, the hasty peas dug in, or as best they could around here, because it's all rock, and held on. But you can see why this position was so important. Because being behind the Germans, it forced their positions at Leonforte and Osoro to be evacuated. The Canadians have come up behind German lines, and now look down on the Germans at Osoro, threatening the defensive line between Leonforte, Osoro, and Ajira. The battle was not yet half an hour old, and already the Germans were counterattacking. The world exploded in an appalling cacophony of sound and fury. The grass plateau, on which nearly 500 men were now crowded, virtually vanished under a mounting pall of dust and smoke, shot through with malevolent tongues of flame. The fury of the barrage was paralyzing. I lay flat on my belly behind a section of stone fence, scrabbling at the rock-hard ground with my tin hat in a frenzied attempt to burrow into the heart of the mountain. Shortly thereafter, we heard an upsurge of vehicle noise. The Germans were giving up a sorrow. All day, the Germans desperately counterattack, trying to regain the heights, but the Canadians hang on. And with their defensive line broken, the Germans have no choice but to retreat. The Hasty Peas have revenged the death of their commander, Bruce Sutcliffe. The fortress town of Osoro has fallen to the Canadians, but the German army is determined to escape from Sicily to Italy at the port of Messina, and they try to delay the Canadians at Leonforte and Ajira. After a vicious battle, the Canadians capture Leonforte. Pursuing the retreating Germans, they fight their way towards yet another hilltop fortress at Ajira.
Here, the Germans put up a desperate last-minute resistance. But then they retreat from the town. The Canadians move in. Ajira is liberated. In four weeks, fighting in Sicily, the Canadians have suffered over 2,000 casualties, including 562 dead. This is the grave of Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Crow. He was the CO of the Royal Canadian Regiment, and during the action at Nisseria, he was cut down by a hail of German machine gun bullets. He was killed in action July 24th, 1943. The personal inscription reads, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Ralph Crow was 31 years old. This is the grave of Private Sidney John Cousins from Manitoba. He served with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry and during the heavy fighting in Leonforte, when the Prats were being driven back by German machine gun nests. And Cousins grabbed the Bren gun and put it on his hip and attacked the Germans, killing them and driving them off, which was a terrific act of bravery. But he was killed later in the day. Killed in action, July 22nd, 1943, aged 23. The battle for Sicily lasted 38 days, and it was a great success for Canada. Our troops showed that they could match the best the Germans had, and they could function under very difficult circumstances. But most importantly, they got battle experience at quite a cost, as this cemetery can attest. And this experience was going to come in very handy in the next operation, the invasion of Italy. In Ajira, the Canadians hold a concert in the main square to celebrate their victory the first one in liberated Europe, and it seems like an allied triumph. But the Germans in Sicily have achieved their main objective. Retreating across the Strait of Messina, their army of 60,000 men has been saved to fight again in Italy. Just four weeks later, the campaign continues. The Canadians and the Allies invade mainland Italy. The Allied invasion has led to the overthrow of the fascists, and the new Italian government now surrenders. The Italian army ceases to fight. But Italy is still occupied by hundreds of thousands of German troops. And turning on their former Italian allies, the Germans decide to turn all of Italy into a battleground. Blowing up bridges and mining roads to delay the Allied advance. The Allied plan is to drive north, up the coast, past the city of Ortona, encircle Rome, and seize the capital by the end of the year. As the Canadians push north, through town after town to Campobasso, everywhere they are treated by the Italians as liberators. But the retreating Germans stop at river crossings and mountain passes to fight stubborn rearguard actions. And the Canadians in their first three months on the Italian mainland suffer 300 dead and thousands of wounded. As casualties rise, the 1st Canadian Division calls for reinforcements. Among the new troops is an eager young volunteer with the Perth Regiment, 19-year-old Stan Sislowski. When I got sent to Italy, I was thrilled. Man, this is, this is what I was I, uh, wanted to get in the Army. I was going to be Canada's national hero. I was going to go down the, our main street in a ticker tape parade. You know, all that silly stuff of youth wanting to get at him. Uh. 
It, it was not a pleasant place, really. It was um, in a bad state. It was uh, kind of depressing. Looking at all these uh, derelict buildings, uh, bombed out buildings, the people in poverty, uh, hunger. We had had to march 38 miles up and down hills, and it was a rigorous march. We were hungry and uh, thirsty, and there was this big watermelon field. And I got a watermelon, and a farmer coming, hysterics there, uh, Mama, me, uh, me, you know, whatever he was saying to me. Well, I, w I felt like a kid that was stealing water. I mean, I had a rifle with me. I could have told him, bugger off, man. Uh, but uh, I snuck away. I put the watermelon down. I snuck away like a kid caught in the act uh, stealing cookies from a jar. We had just arrived in Italy a month before, maybe a little more, and a game of volleyball was introduced to us. But I played on a team with this Joe Gallant, an older fellow, the kind of guy, guy you call Pop. He must have been all of 36 or something. Anyway, I was on his team, and every time a ball came my way, instead of going over the net, it went to the left, or went to the right. And uh, since I didn't swear much in those days, I'd always say, gall darn it, gall darn it. And uh, Joe got mad at me, I guess, and he says, you don't even talk like a man. So I popped him one, knocked him on the ground, and he jumped up, I popped him again, knocked him. He was up and down like a yo-yo. But he didn't hold it against me. He stuck his hand out, he shook hands with me, he said, sorry, Stan. On the day of our battle, he became uh, depressed, deeply depressed. And uh, he kept telling me, well, Stan, this is, this is it. I'm going, I'll be gone. And I'm trying to cheer him up. I said, Joe, my God, it'll be a guy like me, a crazy bugger like me, not you, hell, you know. But uh, the first bomb that landed, landed right behind him, and he was gone. And we lost 47 men killed. And I don't know how many were wounded, but there were quite a few. So uh, we lost our first battle. I was scared, but I had managed to keep control of myself. As the Canadians continue to pursue the Germans, the war in Italy is becoming what will be their longest campaign. Italy is a country of mountain after mountain, ridge after ridge, an ideal place for defense. But so far, the Germans have only fought and run. By winter, the Canadians advancing towards the city of Ortona arrive at the Moro River. And it is here that the Germans decide to fight. Here the Canadians will face their biggest battle yet. This is the Canadian battlefield of December 1943. I'm on the south bank of the Moro River, and of course the Canadian front lines ran right out to the Adriatic, which you can see over here. Down in the middle before us is the Moro River, and the other side are the Germans. For the first time in the war, the Canadians were going to be the spearhead of the attack, and all they had to do was cross this river valley and go and capture Ortona. About to attack across the Moro with the Royal Rifles of Canada is Major Strom Galloway. Our orders were to burst through the bridgehead over the Moro. The staff always used colorful words like that, especially when the bursting was to be done by someone else. The plan was we would sweep down on a two company front, clearing the enemy out between the road and the river. The enemy, of course, had different ideas. Shells screamed above us from our batteries behind the town. A mile away, machine guns stuttered in the vineyards across the Moro River. A 
died so, we arrived on the battlefront. This is the Moro River. It's not much today, but in December 1943, it was swollen with the winter rains. The weather in Italy was terrible, and the men used to joke amongst themselves, welcome to sunny Italy. But it really was no joke. This area became a morass, and it bogged down the Canadian armor, which meant the infantry had to make the attacks alone. Joining the attack across the Moro with the hasty peas is intelligence officer Farley Mowat. What followed was the kind of night men dream about in after years, waking in a cold sweat to a surge of gratitude that it is but a dream. It was a delirium of sustained violence. Soldiers of both sides blundering through the vineyards fired with panicky impartiality in all directions. Our orders were to engage the enemy closely. This order was superfluous. The Germans now proceeded to engage us as closely as they could. The cost had been appalled. When the firing died down in our sector, stretcher and burial parties scouring the slimy slopes and the tangles of shell-torn debris found 170 German corpses. Our own dead and wounded amount to a third of the 400 or so hasty peas who had gone into the Valley of the Shadow. After six days of fighting, the Canadians finally cross the Moro River and reach another formidable obstacle, a deep six kilometer long rift in the coastal plateau, fortified by the Germans and known as the Gully. This is a German defensive position known as the Gully, just south of Ortona. The first attacks against the Gully had gone very poorly, but on December 13th, the Canadians had found a weak point just at the head over here. The unit given the job of exploiting this position was the Van Dues, or the Royal 22nd Regiment. And on the morning of December 14th, assisted by tanks of the Ontario Regiment, they came across the Gully just over here and came onto the German side and started their attack towards Ortona. What the Van Dues didn't know was that the Germans had reinforced the position, and when they were in this area, they were hit with a torrent of artillery fire and were being decimated. Their commander, Paul Triquet, urged the men on to their objective, Casa Berardi. Canadians have fought their way to within a few kilometers of Ortona with heavy casualties. And now Casa Berardi, a large stone farmhouse in a strategic position and heavily fortified by the Germans, blocks their way to the city. Leading his company's attack on Casa Berardi is Captain Paul Triquet of the Van Dues Regiment. After a terrific barrage, we started attacking, and immediately after we crossed the line, we found a very big platoon of Germans. There were German tanks coming at us from a barn. We lost about 30 men at this point, and we had only just begun. So we were alone and advancing and firing and stopping and jumping around. And I kept losing more men all the time. We were surrounded on all sides. There was no going back, so we started down to the only safe place around, this big farmhouse. For hundreds of years, the Berardi family had farmed here, and now their house was the center of the Canadian attack. Lanfranco Berardi was five years old when the Canadians began to shell his home. E noi abbiamo usato questa stalla durante la guerra come rifugio. Questa stalla era occupata da un certo numero di mucche da questa parte, dove sono io, 
e di là da quell'altra parte eravamo una quarantina di persone uomini, donne e bambini io ero un bambino da avevo 5 anni i bombardamenti erano talmente forti, intensi e continui per cui la paura non ci lasciava mai io ogni tanto domandavo a mia madre quando è che moriamo noi? With the Van Doos is 23-year-old Claude Chatillon. Opposite Casa Berardi, which we can see on the other side of the gully, the breeze brings us the noise of a violent firefight. The staccato sound of tank machine guns and the boom of their cannon shot hitting something hard, the walls of a building. The fight seems to be much worse over there. Ah, il contatto è stato molto strano e molto singolare. I canadesi sparavano tutto ciò che si muoveva. Quindi hanno sparato anche a me che giocavo qui. E non mi hanno preso, come si vede. Ma qui si vedono i segni de, delle cartucce, delle schegge, dei combattimenti che ci sono stati. We make a rapid count. There must be 20 explosions almost at the same time. One man panicking gets up and starts running. I shout at him to drop down. Another salvo. The soldier falls. He is still. Another soldier is screaming. I'm in hell. Siamo pieni di, 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 di schegge, di, di pallottole. Questo è tedesco, di un fucile tedesco. Guardi, qua ce n'è uno addirittura, guardi. Questa è una scheggia di granata d'artiglieria. Questa scheggia qui addirittura un uomo lo trancia in due. Prego, un souvenir di Casa Bernardi, lo posso anche lasciare. Of the 80 Canadians who set out to take Casa Berardi, soon only nine are left. I look through my binoculars. What a show. To the left of Casa Berardi, the Germans are pulling back. Some are shooting while they retreat. Gunshots and the babble of machine guns. Other Germans flee toward the backyard of the building. Some hide behind trees, and some Germans fall. I have a very bad memory. And here, in this tree, ci fu un gruppo di tedeschi che si ritiravano e portavano con loro un ragazzo, sarà stato per avuto 14 anni, era ferito, era pieno di sangue. E lo adagiarono qui, seduto qui, e piangeva, diceva mamma, mamma, mamma. Io ero piccolo, mi sono avvicinato, ho cercato, gli abbiamo dato l'acqua, qualcosa, perché faceva pena. Dopo 10 minuti l'hanno preso, l'hanno portato via e sono andati via. For five long days the Germans counterattack again and again, desperate to take Casa Berardi. But Paul Triquet's Van Dues hold on. This is a memorial to the Royal 22nd Regiment, the Van Dues, and it's located right on the Casa Berardi battlefield. You can actually see where they made their approach on December 14, 1943. Monuments to Canadians in Italy are very rare, and this is a fine tribute to Canada. My young French Canadians were superb. They showed great courage against vastly superior forces. The reaction I got from my men is terrific. The bravest man in war is always the private because he can only follow. And it takes a brave man to do that. This is Morrow River Canadian War Cemetery. It contains the graves of 1,400 Canadians killed in the Battle of the Morrow River. Here's one of the early ones. Private Robert Stewart of Welland, Ontario. Royal Canadian Regiment. He was killed crossing the River Valley, 9th December 1943, age 31. He giveth his beloved sleep. This is the grave of Mitch Sterlin. He was killed in action at Ortona Crossroads on December 19, 1943. 
His personal inscription is from the Talmud. Some gain eternity in a lifetime, others gain it in one brief hour. He was 22 years old. In one short year, 1943, the Canadians landed on the beaches of Sicily and fought their way a thousand kilometers to the gates of Ortona. But even after a great battle there, for the Canadians there will be many other battles. A long road lies ahead. Celebrated as liberators of Italy, they are for a moment no longer forgotten. But today, all that remains of their exploits are cemeteries, rarely visited reminders of a distant campaign and all but forgotten. <laughs> 